today's scripture reading comes from John 9, verses 1 through 14. As he walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's work may be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is the day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, it is he. Others were saying, no, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they asked him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. Then I went, washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees a man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. The word of the Lord. You guys may take a seat. Thanks. Thanks, Essie. Thank you so much. Hey, good morning, Poyaloma. Good morning. My name is Lexi, and it's an honor to be with you guys here today. I know that usually when people come up here and preach, they show a really cool picture of their kids or a cute picture of their dog, but I don't have kids yet and I don't have a picture of my dog. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, first of all, actually, before I say anything, I would love to wish my sister Angel happy birthday. Could you guys say happy birthday on the count of three? One, two, three. Happy love you. <laughs> so um, I am a senior here at Point Loma. I'm a Bib Studies major, a Biblical Studies major. I am a commuter from Chula Vista, so shout out, CV. Um, I'm also part of the Mosaic program here on campus, which promotes diversity on campus. And I am also the chapel intern, so if you would like to pray or read scripture, please let me know and we'll get your name on the list. And also, last but not least, I want to take some time to honor my parents for being here today. And I want to honor Mary Paul and um, Melanie Wolf and Esteban Trujillo for, and the rest of the spiritual development staff for giving me the opportunity to be able to speak today. So thank you so much. Um, also, as you guys know, we have been in this series called Down to Earth. And this series is based on the Lord's Prayer from Matthew 6, 9 to 14. And it talks a lot about, about how we as disciples of God, as the people of God should pray. And my first experience being able to say this prayer out loud was actually here in chapel my freshman year. And it was kind of an odd experience um, when I first knew about this prayer. I mean, it was growing up. In children's church, it was growing up, you know, in youth group or sometime at church talking about it. But I've never actually said it in unison and with the whole church. And so I understand that, you know, all of us have a different background, a different journey. And this prayer may mean something very different to all of us. And so we want to talk a little bit about what that prayer is this semester. Mary Paul started talking about this prayer in the beginning of the semester by saying how deep this prayer is. There's deep roots in this prayer. And we've been praying this prayer in our Christian tradition for a long time, for generations and generations. And Dr. Brower even talked about keeping, um, keeping God's name holy. And Danny Kim talked about our Father in heaven and what that means for us to be sons and daughters and God to be our Father. And also the last time we met Esteban Trujillo, he talked about God's kingdom coming and his will being done in our lives. He discussed what the kingdom of God is, the now and the not yet. He shared how important it is to desire God's kingdom ultimately above our own kingdom. He said whenever two kingdoms collide, it gets messy and things start to crumble. And once our kingdom crumbles and we become citizens of God's kingdom, 
That's when true transformation happens. And so today, I'll be talking about the second part of that verse, on earth as it is in heaven. So Esteban set it up, and I'm just going to take the second part of it. He put the peanut butter, I put the jelly, he heated up the tortilla, and I'm bringing the frijoles. So it's going to be good. It's going to be really, really good. And before we start, could you please pray for me, with me today? Please pray with me. For me and with me, man, come on. Um, Bow your heads with me. Father, we thank you so much for being the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Thank you, Father, for dying on the cross and defeating death. And thank you for letting us be citizens of your kingdom and being sons of daughters. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So this verse that my wonderful friend Cecia just read for us was John 9, 9 to 14. And this story is about Jesus, how he saw a man in need, and how he stopped. This man was blind, and his disciples thought that he deserved to be blind because of some sin, whether it was his parents' sin or his own sin. And in this context, people equated bad circumstances with angering God, whether it was a natural disaster, a a birth defect, or even a famine. There was no other explanation but to think that there was some sin that these people did or something that their parents did that made them deserving of this horrible punishment from God. But Jesus had a different response. Jesus said in verse 3, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's work might be revealed in him. And we cannot deny the fact that creation is broken in some sense. However, we do serve a God who is great at renewing, restoring, and redeeming because he is faithful. And what Jesus does next, it just blows my mind and it kind of grosses us out. But Jesus reminds us that he is present. He's present on earth. And so to demonstrate that, he takes his own spit, he takes some dirt, and he rubs it together to make mud and rubs it on these blind man's eyes. He goes and tells him to wash, and after he washes off the mud, he gains sight. And so the people that used to know him didn't recognize him anymore. And if you continue reading, it says that Jesus performed this miracle on the Sabbath, which was a huge problem according to the Pharisees and Jewish leaders. So needless to say... We serve a God who breaks the rules. I think who Jesus is and what he did here is a perfect example of what heaven looks like on earth. And the first thing that we see is that heaven on earth looks like everyday moments. It looks like forgiveness and it looks like choosing to love, choosing to act for justice, choosing to give selflessly. It looks like choosing to take time to break bread with friends and hang out. And it looks like just resting in God's presence. And in this moment, Jesus chose to stop. He chose to stop with someone who looked different, someone who needed him, someone who couldn't ever repay him for what he did. And it is in the everyday moments of stopping and being intentional and recognizing that God is present. And this is what we're talking about when we say the now and the not yet. It's the now. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's in this very moment in Brown Chapel. It's in your next class. And it's when you graduate. It's it's the now moment that we live in every day. The mundane and the exciting parts. And the not yet is the epic, well-awaited moment when Jesus returns and when we are in heaven with him. Heaven is wherever God is present. It's where two or more are gathered And it is here on earth just as much as it is in heaven. And the second thing that we see from John 9 is that heaven on earth looks like God invading earth. And so I want to ask if if you guys have ever had this friend or a family member that doesn't really understand the difference between a personal life or a public life. They just seem to hang around so much that you might as well just call them your family because they're always around. Well, I have this friend and his name is Alex Huerta. He is a sophomore here at Point Loma and he's also dating my sister Angel. 
And um, Alex is that friend that doesn't knock on the door before coming in the house. Um, I got got an amen in front for my parents. Um, He's kind of like Kimmy from Full House, if you know who I'm talking about. Um, he, He invades our house. He invades our house. He doesn't knock. He invades our fridge. He eats all of our desserts and the food in our fridge. He invades our living room and takes naps on our couches. He... He is the perfect example of what a friend would be like invading our lives. And in the same way, in the sa- oh yeah, if you're sitting next to one of those people, can you give them a nudge real quick and just be like, yeah, 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 you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so in the same way, when Jesus came down to earth, he didn't just come down. He straight invaded our lives. For example, like we just read in John 9, Jesus invaded the religious rule by healing on the Sabbath. And in the New Testament, it talks about how he invaded the lives of the disciples. He was talking to them and saying like, yeah, I know like you're fishing and you're doing this net thing, but I'm going to need you to put that stuff down and come follow me. And then he also invaded Samaria. He invaded social norms that said you cannot talk to women alone. He also invaded the Roman Empire, and people called him Jesus, the king of the Jews, and that really threatened the Romans. But they didn't realize that Jesus' kingdom was in heaven, and he was just trying to bring it here on earth among us. And as I said before, God is just as present on earth as he is in heaven. And sometimes it's hard living present with God, because that means less distractions. It means our kingdoms crumble, it means his will goes before our will, and that means God is in the middle of our dirt. He comes and he invades our life. He invades every part of our life. He invades the fun stuff and the great exciting parts of our lives, but he also invades the hard times and the pain and the grief. He invades the dirt that we try to scoop under the rug so that no one can tell what's really going on. He invades the dirt that we've been holding onto for so long. He wants to be a part of every area of our lives. And so God, in all of his heavenly glory, humbled himself and came down to earth to invade the dirt in our lives. It says throughout scripture that there are places where Jesus physically demonstrates moments where he comes down to earth. One of those moments is in John 8, where Jesus kneels down and he writes something in the dirt before these accusers that are trying to stone this woman who just committed adultery. And they come before Jesus and they say, Jesus, you know the law. Jesus, you know the law. You know that this woman is supposed to be stoned for her sin. So what do you say, Jesus? So he comes down. He kneels and he he writes in the dirt and says, You know what? The first person that sinned, let him throw the stone. And one by one, his accusers, her accusers walked away. And then in Luke 22, it says that Jesus knelt down and prayed the night before his crucifixion. And he said, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done, God. And as we read in John 9, Jesus kneeled down before this blind man and took some dirt. He spit in it, made mud, and that is what he used to heal this blind man. When Jesus came down, he did not just come to be present in humankind, but he came to be present in all of creation. We recognize that there is a brokenness about earth. We realize that there is pain, there is grief and destruction But I love what Christy said on Monday morning. She said that God defeated death. Christ defeated death on the cross and he is in control and he is present. And that is the hope that we hold on to. In Colossians 1.20, it says, And through him being Jesus, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. And I love this paraphrased version. It says, not only that, but all the broken and dislocated pieces of the universe, people and things, animals and atoms, 
get properly fixed and fit together in vibrant harmonies, all because of his death, his blood that poured down from the cross. And so Jesus came down to earth to transform creation. Jesus came down to earth to reconcile and redeem all of creation. And so this is the last thing that we see from John 9, is that heaven on earth looks like transformation. And I know that some of you today might be like, Lexi, you don't understand the dirt that I've been carrying. You don't understand how long I've been carrying the dirt. And some of us have been carrying this dirt for years. And we think it's almost impossible for God to do anything with it. But I'm coming here to tell you today that even still with your dirt, it's not too much for God. And that he can use that same dirt to transform your life. Today, it may be a physical transformation. And I believe that the same God that healed in John 9 is the same God that is here today, the same God that we serve today. But maybe it's not a physical transformation. Maybe it's a transformation of the heart. Maybe it's getting rid of some mindsets, getting rid of an addiction. And maybe it's forgiveness. Maybe it's time to forgive someone that you've just been holding on to way too long. And maybe it's even taking time to forgive yourself. Maybe it's a transformation of a lifestyle and using less, consuming less, and wasting less. But whatever that transformation is, I want to remind you that every transformation that God does has a purpose. And that when God spiritually opens our eyes to new things, it changes the way that we live so that we can live for God. When this man was healed, the other people in the town couldn't recognize him. And this is my favorite part. It says that this man looked completely different to people. They, were, they couldn't even recognize him. And it was weird because it was one physical transformation. But I believe it was so much more than that. I believe when God transforms our life, like I said, he doesn't just transform one area of our life, but he transforms every area of our life. He takes the dirt, he takes the things that we hide from others, he takes every part of our lives and transforms it. So I don't believe it, wasn't, it was just his eyes, but I believe it might have been his posture, it might have been a smile on his face, it may have been the confidence in his voice, or the eye contact that he gave people when he was talking about this Jesus that healed him. And so today... I believe that if we were truly transformed, if we were wholly transformed by God, that things in our lives would look a lot differently and that we would even see things differently. And so today, we have the opportunity to pray as we do every Wednesday. But today I wanna take this time, I wanna intentionally leave space and end early so that we're not worried about this next class that we have to do or this next exam, but that we could be intentional and that we can be present right now as heaven meets earth. We have the opportunity to pray for areas that we want to see heaven meet earth in our own lives. And we have this amazing space here in Brown Chapel. We have comfy pillows on the floor. We have an awesome band that's gonna come up and play and linger for a little bit. We have staff that are here that want to anoint, want to pray with you guys and are here just to listen. And we also have these rocks up here on the altar where you can hold a rock, whether it's weird or not to you. It's a, just a symbol of being able to pray for earth and having heaven come on earth and maybe you want to pray for what's going on in these cities, in different countries, or maybe the own dirt in our lives. So before I dismiss and invite everybody up to pray, I'd love to pray with us. Heavenly Father, you are worthy to be praised. We pray that your kingdom would come and crush our kingdom. We surrender ourselves to you completely, so have your way in our lives. Thank you for invading our lives, just like chapel invades our schedule. 
you come and you transform. This is what you do best, God. I pray that as we leave today that we would be intentional, that we would recognize that you are present on earth, that you are present in the dirt of our lives, and that you are present in every beautiful thing between. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You guys are dismissed.